in. All right, well, tonight I wanted to kind of finish up on the message I started last week. I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't really get very far because uh, if you remember at the end of that, I said, man, I just really feel like the Lord is just pleased in here tonight. And there was just this big God smile that just felt like it was just showering the church. So I didn't get very far. I, I talked a little bit about, uh, you know, we're coming, we've come out of the fast. Now we're done. Now we're in this new place in life. And how many of you are still enjoying this new place that God has you in the fast through all that? Man, that's wonderful. And uh, so, you know, we're kind of, especially with this week too, we're kind of on that plane now. And the fast really is just nothing but a distant memory to us. You know, some of us are more thankful than others. But no matter where you are in that, it's like there's a settling. <clears throat> I explain this. There's a settling that happens in the kingdom. Um, whenever we go into new places, for a while, the new is exciting, right? It's like you get a new toy. Uh, you get a new Christmas gift. You get a birthday gift. And, and that stuff is fun. But then what do you do when the new wears off? You know, is it still fun? Is it still exciting whenever all of a sudden, well, it's just not as shiny as it used to be. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That doesn't, go, that doesn't apply for your spouse. Your spouse is always shiny and new. You can't trade them in and get something else. It doesn't. The church doesn't operate that way. The world might, but the church doesn't. But when the new wears off of things, it really kind of shows, I think, our hearts about where we are. You know, will we keep with that or do we just simply toss it to the side and do something else? And in, the, in these new places that God takes us after a fast, you know, it's still relatively new. It's only been a couple of weeks. But um, in that, once you start walking that road and that line and the new starts to kind of flake off and it's like, okay, this is my life now. How does that feel? Because that's exactly, <clears throat> if you remember last week when we talked about Joshua and, and they're going to spy out the promised land, right? Remember that? So they're going to spy it out, and it's a brand new thing to them. Moses is saying, okay, guys, let's go check this place out. Tell us what kind of cities these are. Are they in tents? Are they behind walls? Is it a great land? Is it poor? Is there trees? Is there not? What kind of people are in the place? They're scoping out the new, but we can't forget that as it's new to them, God promised this to Abraham years and years and years back. So this is going to be their homeland. Amen? So the news eventually going to start wearing off of this, and this is just going to be home. Uh, let me give you a great real-life example. When you go away on a trip away from Guymon, even if it's going to Amarillo or going to spend the night in Hardesty or Tyrone or I don't care, it's just somewhere else, and you come back home, isn't it nice to come back home? That feeling of just being like, ah, I'm, I'm home. And whether it's like, oh, God, I'm glad to get out of that traffic. I'm glad to be back home. Let's just please get home. You, that's your settlement. That's your place that God has given you. But yet, even in that place, and you could have been there for years, when you come back, it feels settled. It feels like, yeah, this is how it is. This is how it feels in here every time we come to church. And, of course, you know, we're here, and the staff, we're here a lot throughout the week, but it's something about in church services, when we come together, it's like we're home, you know, it's just kind of nice because we're together, and as goofy as we all are in this church, and I'm talking about you, and I'm looking at each one of you when I say that, goofy, all of us, when we're that way, you know what, there's no better place to do that than in church, amen, I guarantee you the Methodists and the Baptists weren't going to the right and going to the left tonight. <clears throat> they weren't dancing and jump jumping. They may have been, I don't know, but from what I know of Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans, they're really not the type that's going to jump jump. But then again, I could be wrong because Melinda is in the house and she's a staunch Southern Baptist at heart. So if she can do it, I guess anybody can. Amen? <laughs> But in that new place that we're in, God, you know, you'll, you'll kind of get used to that. And then when the new wears off, it's like, what do I do now? This is where they're at as they're going into the promised land. So if you've got your Bibles this evening, turn to the book of Joshua. I kind of ended this, and I wanted to start here by saying that the Lord is a blessing God. And not a prosperity gospel blessing God but a God who just loves to bless his people and his children because we follow his word. Because we have a heart after him to say, God, I love you more than anybody else. How many of you love God the most? 
even more than your husband, your wife, your spouse, your uh, girlfriend, your boyfriend, your favorite TV show, your favorite car, chair, the cat, anything and everything. God's number one, right? That's about the only time you can get away from doing that when I say your spouse. It's the only time they're not going, well, what are you saying? Anybody love? You can love God more. It's okay. They, they love God more than they love you anyway. So it all works together. It's supposed to be that way. The Lord is a blessing God. And he doesn't just desire to prosper you, as we hear, especially in our American culture all the time. Ah, I'm, going to pray. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm going to be prospered above everything else. And, and we all know where that goes. If you stay in that boat long enough, you're going to be rowing out to sea by yourself. And all you're going to be is conceited and selfish. And that's really not really the kingdom. But God doesn't just want to prosper you. He also wants to equip us to be effective in the kingdom. And prosperity does bring that. Amen. People can see that and say, well, man, if God's blessing you with good things and health and, and you're happy in the midst of trials, well, then I want that too. That's prospering. But to be equipped, the Lord says, it's not just about how good your life is. It's about how you can turn that right around and tell somebody else. And God can do this for you too. It is not about me. It's about the Lord. And all of a sudden, they're, they're thrown in the same boat as you are to say, you know what? God will do it for you too. And we've all heard stories and talked about all that. And, and that's exactly where God wants us to be. It says, I want to prosper you, but I want to equip you for my glory. So that when people see you, they truly see me. Amen. So Joshua chapter 24, verse 1 through 3. This is the place where the Lord is beginning to speak to them. They're getting ready to cross the Jordan. They're doing all these things of um, just kind of getting settled into this new place where God has them. So verse 1 through 3 says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, like the heads of the family, not their literal heads, for their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. That's the coolest thing about church, is when we come in here, we are literally presenting ourselves just like Israel did right here, and as they do every week in Jerusalem, we are presenting ourselves before God, before the living, holy Lord God Almighty himself. We come in here, we worship, we give ourselves and however we do, and we are literally presenting ourselves to say, God, here's all of me. Just take me as I am, and praise God, whatever happens, happens. This is exactly where they were. Verse 2 says, Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times. Now, what's the other side of the flood? Not, not the literal flood of the earth, but of the Jordan. Your fathers lived on that side. Your fathers did life on that side. They did things that way. But you're in a new place now. Now I've put you in a different place, and this is where I'm calling you. He said, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor. And they served what kind of gods? Other gods. They didn't serve me. That's why I said, even Terah, the father of Abraham, who is the father of our faith, the one that we look to and go, man, this is where that sucker started. I mean, yeah, it kind of happened in the garden, but... This is where what we know of, of being a believer, not Christianity, but being a believer in Yahweh, this is where this whole thing started. It was with Abraham. So he says, even, even Terah, the father of Abraham, they lived on the other side. And when they lived on the other side, they served other gods. Verse 3 says, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and I led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and I multiplied his seed, and I gave him a son. I gave him an heir. It was only done by my hand because he couldn't have him anyway. So I am the one who prospered him. But I also equipped him in order for us to be talking about God tonight. Abraham had to be obedient where he was. Now jump down to verse 11 through 15. So he's kind of telling them, guys, God's taking us to a new place. And as he takes us in this new place, we have to be attentive to what he's saying to us. Verse 11 through 15. He says, And ye, you all, went over Jordan, and you came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, 
the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Havites, and the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. I'm the one who is your God. Amen. You crossed the Jordan. You came into this place. You moved, you moved into a land that was already settled. They were full of giants and they were full of, of crossbreeds and they didn't like you especially, but they feared the one that you served. Word came around about who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. They understood the battle of Jericho once it happened. They understood the turn of Ai, of how it, they got whooped, but then they turned back around once they repented of sin, <clears throat> how life should be, and all of a sudden God changed it. They understand that. Now, these people aren't nothing because they're like, remember what Caleb said, Caleb Joshua, they're like grasshoppers in my sight. You know, we look like, good grief, they're going to smash us. So we're nothing to them, but the God we serve is much bigger than all of that. So they, they kind of caught that. In verse 12, I love this. It shows you kind of how God works too. It says, And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with the sword and not with the bow. I did it by my hand, and you don't have to worry about anything else. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them of the vineyards and the olive yards or the groves which you did not plant. You're eating of them. You're prospering in a place that I sent for you. This is the place that God is setting up in your lives right now. Your best days are when? Right now. God is calling you right now. You've got even better days ahead? Yes. But who cares? Your best days are right now. Each day you go, it gets better and better and better. It's what the Bible calls going from glory to glory to glory to glory, right? There's no diminishing in the kingdom. We don't sacrifice and, and get subtracted and get demoted in the kingdom. The Lord says, when I call you, that's where I've called you. And that's all you got to worry about. You walk faithful in the calling, then I'll promote you as the time comes. But I want to see your patience. Oh, we all love that word. I want to see your faithfulness to me. I want to see your long suffering. I want to see you if you will still serve me when things aren't going the way you think that they should. But the Lord says, remember all this stuff that happened when you come across, I brought you into this place and put you in a land that you didn't have to build. You're living in houses you didn't have to worry about. You're, you're reaping the benefits of gardens and vineyards and all this stuff that I had other people already prospering in, but I did it for you. Jesus said, I loved you first, so I came and died for you. Amen. We all know John 3.16, or we should. Verse 13, I love that. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities that you did not build, and you live in them. A vineyards and olive yards that you planted not is what you eat of. That's a prospering God. Amen. That's a God who wants to bless his children. But we have to stay. In order to walk and stay in this land, you're going to have to stay on the mountaintop experience you had during that fasting time. Or whenever it's just you and Jesus, because maybe some of you didn't fast in here. When you get close to God and you just have that, oh man, this is so good, stay in those moments. But take that back down the mountain with you as we go back into life. Because you can't stay up on the mountain all the time. I've tried. It doesn't work. You know, we, we come through this fast. I told Melinda that a couple days ago. I said, man, I didn't, I didn't just lose an edge in the fasting, but I liked it better there. Even though I didn't like what I was doing, I liked it a whole lot better when I was fasting. You're closer to God. You know, or at least it feels like it. You're probably not, but it feels like it. You know, it feels like I, I'm giving up my life. I'm giving up, I'm sacrificing this for you, God. I mean, did anybody feel closer in the fast than maybe kind of what you do right now in that everyday walk? Even though you're close with him, I do too. I'm like, I kind of feel like I've lost that edge. But I don't want to go back. You know, I don't want to go back and just, okay, I'm going to live my life fasting that way. I, you'll have a new pastor within about two months because I'll be dead. So I don't want to do that necessarily, but I want to keep that mountaintop experience. I want to keep that closeness that when we come down the mountain and we go back into the valley and we're living life and stuff happens, that I can remember that same word that he gave the children of Israel. I put you in a land you didn't have to worry about. I blessed you from the very beginning. So you walk in that blessing. That's where I want to stay. But we got to stay on the mountaintop, even when you come back down. Amen? And we all will come back down. You'll, you'll come back down at some point. Doesn't mean you'll never go back up. 
That's why Jesus said, when you pray, when you fast. When you're feeling like the valley's getting more of you and you're kind of getting hemmed in by the enemy and it feels like they can't do anything else, hmm, that's probably a good time to start fasting and praying again. It's time to recharge that battery and go back up on the mountain because you, maybe you're about to get defeated right there. Flipping your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. I want to take you back to that place where God literally showed up to the children of Israel, presented himself, and let's see how they weenied out and didn't do what they were supposed to do. Exodus chapter 19, verse 1 through 8. Don't worry about your kiddo. You're great. I love him. No, I don't want another one. I'll just love yours from a distance. Don't let Melinda hold him. Exodus 19, verse 1 through 8 says, In the third month, when the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, so they're leaving one old place and coming into a new, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So they're leaving a place of prosperity, but yet bondage. And they're moved into a new place, and God's starting to lead them through the wilderness. But it's like they're coming into a new place, and they're excited. You know, if you remember, they left Egypt. They had gold. They had silver. They had, I mean, they left literally robbing the place blind. They gave it to them to get out of here because our firstborn is dead. Our country is destroyed because of you and your God. Leave. We'll give you anything you want. So they've left, but now they're going into the wilderness of Sinai, which they left prosperity to go into desolation, but yet they've never been richer because they have God on their side in a brand new way. It says, For they had departed from Rephidim and had come into the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before what? The mountain. They camped before the very place where, where the Lord appeared to Moses first and said, You go back to Egypt. You tell Pharaoh what I'm going to tell him. You guys are going to come back here and worship me here. I'm going to start everything right here. So they're back, and they're camping at the bottom of the mountain. Verse 3 says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, This is what you say to the house of Jacob, and to tell the children of Israel. You saw what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people." Oh, this can be good. How many of you are a peculiar treasure in here? Yes, you are. Absolutely. So the Lord said, you're going to be that special treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Oh, I, 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 can't, I can't go any further. i got to do this. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're pretty peculiar. <laughs> I just... I'm glad I can even say that word correctly. That's the weirdest word to even say. It's like, pleckler, pleckler, pleckler. Pleckler, You're pleckler. Okay, anyway. But that's just good, uh, that's just a good place to know. that You know what? We're all just a little bit goofy. That's, that's nice. I would say that's what that means in the Hebrew, but it just might. So we'll, we'll just take it. Verse 6 says, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He said, These are the words that you need to speak to the children of Israel. And Moses came, and he called for the elders of the people, and he laid before their faces all the words which the Lord had commanded. And all the people, say all, all the people answered together. They were all in agreement, Right? They all agreed together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Okay. They all, they all basically said this. Amen. Amen means let it be so. It's the same word that Mary used to the angel. When, she gave the message, when he gave the message, she said, Let it be unto me as you have spoken. That's what amen is in the longer form. They all said, Amen. We will do it. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now they're hung by their tongue. They've committed. They have that oral Torah literally spoken from God to them, back from them, back to God. The covenant has been made because they said, yes, we will do it. You guys remember a time, you, know, you remember eight tracks and that stuff, so you'll probably remember this a little bit. You remember that time whenever you would, you would 
make a sale or an agreement with somebody or a party and you did it by the spoken word or by a handshake, same thing, same covenant, same principle. Matter of fact, when we bought our house in Texoma, we bought that house on a handshake. We agreed on the price of that house on a first and foremost on a handshake. He said, your word is your bond to me. And that's as good enough as a signed contract, even though we had to do that for bank purposes and stuff. But we stood in that living room and we said, you know what, let's do it. We feel like this is God. We all nodded our heads and said yes. And we shook hands right there. And then we turned around and grabbed hands and all four of us prayed in that living room. That's just as good as signing your life away on a contract. And this is exactly what they were doing. They were giving an oral covenant back to God, and God spoke it to them first. They give it back to God and say, we will do everything that you said that, that we need to do. We will, we will absolutely do it. Hmm. Let's see if it happens. Jump to chapter 20, verse 18 to 21. God says, okay, great. I'm going to come down. I'm going to visit you. Remember, he says that. Moses says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Stay away from your family. Stay away from your spouse. Dedicate yourself to God. He's coming. Get ready. Verse 18 says, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning. This is the place where that Imagine Dragon song comes in and everyone's watching and listening to it. And the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they what? They, they left. They ran. And they stood afar off. They didn't say, but wouldn't it back just a chapter that they said, everything God says to do, we'll do. God is the one initially who, or who initiated the invite for them to come to him. They said, I'm coming to the mountain. And when I do, I want you to draw close because I, I want to meet you there. And so when he comes, they've already disobeyed because they ran from him. Oh, I'm about to get on your toes quick. And how true is that in the church that when we need to run to God, we run away from God. When we need to go to the altar and repent for the sin or the junk or the problems or the whatever is in our life, and it's the very reason that we have to go to the bathroom. It's the very reason why I left the stove on. Honey, let's go ahead and leave now in case the house burns down. And we're leaving during the altar time when God wants to draw you close to the mountain. And we're going, oh, no. Oh, no. You know what? We better go. I think I left the dog running. We better go do something else. And they're like, you left the dog running? Yes. Get, let's get out of here right now. You know, that's the kind of, that's the very same thing that happens. And we all know what that's like, right? We've all seen somebody do that. You know, not us, but somebody else. And, and that's exactly what they did. God showed up. They took off. It says, they stood from afar, and they said unto Moses, verse 19, you speak with this, and we'll hear. But don't let God speak with this, because if he does, we're going to die. He will kill us. All they were doing is they were experiencing the manifest presence of God. And yeah, you're going to feel like you're going to die in that place. Absolutely, because it's so much bigger, it's so much more than what we can stand as humans. So you feel like, you know, you're Isaiah. What was me? I'm a man of unclean lips. We saw that last time. You know, you're, you're Daniel. You're all these people who are troubled just by the mere presence of God. But that doesn't mean God was going to kill them. It just means they were having to deal with this giant place of his presence in their life, and they failed the test immediately. Verse 20 says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you or to test you, that his fear may be before your faces, that you will not sin. That you'll trust him. Because you'll find out real quick, he's bigger than anything that you would ever do. And the people still stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. It looks scary the closer you get to God. Absolutely. The closer you move into the places of God, it's like, I don't know if I should be here. I don't know if this is good. I feel like I'm going to die. You know, you, you'll have all these insecurities come up because the closer you get to God, the more wretched you find out that you are. You find out how unholy I really am. You find out what kind of thoughts are really going on. We find out what our hearts really are made of, and they're not as pure as we think we are. You know, that word that Pastor Ronnie gave us years ago, I think of that all the time. 
He said, when you go there, you tell the people what God said because they don't know as much as they think they know. And it's absolutely true. We always think we're further with God than what we really are. We always think that we've got it just a little bit better than where we really are. But you can't find that until you find God's presence. That's what changes the keys. So this is their response. And so I turn that back to you and say, when God calls you to the mountain, what will be your response? Will we go into the thick darkness like Moses and go, okay. Or will we back off and say, no, 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 no. Pastor, you speak to God for us and we'll listen to you. But don't, don't make us go there because if we do, we'll, we'll die. If we do, God's going to get too much in my business. And if you get in my business, at least you try to make it funny. God doesn't joke with me. He kind of seems to get right up in my face, and I don't know if I like that. You know, I only do it because that's the only way that I can be mean to you and spank you on the butt, and you still like it. You know, if I, if I disciplined you the way I disciplined my boys, you wouldn't like that. But to, to do it and where you're like, yeah, it's so funny and that is so true, that's nothing more than a spanking. I've just learned how to do it the fun way. Amen? And that's, that's okay because God uses that for sure. But it's funny how when God, God meets you face to face, like we did on Sunday, he don't play games. He is right there. He is serious about whatever he's asking us to do, and we better do it. And yet it breaks us down, but yet that's the best thing ever. So it's just it's a God thing for sure. So this is their response, and jump to chapter 32 and look at verse 1 through 6. Let me show you what happens next. So Moses ascends into the thick darkness, and this is where the Ten Commandments come in. He's up there 40 days, 40 nights. He's not eating or drinking. It's a supernatural place that God is keeping him alive in. But he's up there. He's in the presence of God. You don't need that stuff anyway when you're with God, but... He's up there in that place. The Lord is writing out the law that we know of as the law of Moses, the word of God. He's, he's writing this out for him to bring down to the people and start imparting this in this new people, in this new place. So meanwhile, while he's up there being holy and spiritual, let's find out what the rest of the church is doing. Chapter 32, verse 1 through 6, it says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, they gathered themselves together unto Aaron. And they said to him, Get up and make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. We don't know where he's at. As far as we know, he went up there and tripped and broke his neck and is dead. And what do we do? He's not coming back. Amen. You know, it's like if we did a fast and for 40 days I was gone, I left the church and I went to the Black Mesa and camped out for 40 days. And you're like, anybody know where pastor's at? You know, after about seven to 10 days, you'd kind of be concerned, maybe. After about two or three weeks, we'd be like, all right, does anybody know? Melinda's like, I have no idea. He didn't even tell me. I just came home and he was gone. After 30 days, after a month, mom's coming across the state trying to find me. You know, she's like, all right, I don't know where my son's at, but either he's dead or something. 38, day 39, 40 days, and they're like, we got to get a new pastor. I mean, I don't know where he must have died. You know, aliens took him. He's been the Enoch thing, and Jesus took him. We don't know what's happened. They're looking for new leadership. They're looking for somebody else to help them in that place. And so they naturally, they go to the one who is next in command that they knew of in Egypt, and that was Aaron. And they start asking him, we don't know what happened to Moses, so make us gods that will go before us unto God. Now, this is a misnomer, and I'll do it really quick because I don't want to get into it big time. Everybody thinks that when they worship the golden calf, that they're worshiping this calf as God. That's not true. This calf was replacing Moses. They still worship Jehovah. They were still worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was still supreme God. But you got to remember where they came out of. They came out of Egypt. And Egypt, when they had the gods, when they had Set, when they had the sun gods, the moon gods, remember you ever seen Prince of Egypt or any of this? They got the alligator looking heads and the goats and all these different things. It's just if you study out the, uh, I won't get sidetracked, I'll come back, God, I promise. If you, you just, you're getting into my world when I say this stuff, so I'll just open up everything to you. If you look, if you study the plagues out, each plague literally took out every Egyptian god that was in the land. Everything that they worshipped, it literally destroyed. God destroyed it, and that just shows you, I'm God, they're not, we're moving on. 
So in this place, whenever they're going, they're used to having a God who is a mediator, just like Jesus is to us. He's, he's a mediator for the Father to earth for us. He died on the cross, so he's the one who covers that sin. They were used to a mediator of Egyptian gods that would speak to God for them. That's why they said, no, no, Moses, you do it. Moses was that God to them because they didn't know how to approach God on a personal level, just like much of the churches today don't know how to approach God on a personal level. They, had, they want a mediator. They want leadership to go to God for them, a priest, a pastor, um, a father, a um, you know, any, any, anybody like that. Uh, Catholicism is really good at it. You really get to see this in modern day form. Um, they'll go and pray unto the saints, unto Mary, um, to help aid their prayers. They're not believing in Mary as God, but they're going to them as mediators to say, help us in this place. That's exactly what they're doing here. They go to Aaron and said, make us a calf that will go before us because we don't know where the other guy went. We don't know where Moses went. Moses is the mediator. He's the guy who speaks to God, and we saw how that happened in Egypt. So they're coming to Aaron and puts Aaron in a weird place, but he does it anyway. He says, we don't know what's become of him. Verse 2, it says, Aaron said unto them, well, then break off the golden earrings that are in your ears, in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me. So is it legal for the people of God to have earrings? I say yes. I just don't wear them. And all the people, but maybe I need to start again. And all the people break off the gold, their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. And he received them, and I love this, especially how the authorized version says that, at their hand. They received, he received their betrayal and their sin at their own hand. They delivered it to him. He didn't go take it from them. They delivered it unto him. And I think that's kind of why he said that too. He said, you bring me all the golden earrings, which is everything they got from Egypt, from these people. You bring the earrings from your wives, from your sons, from your daughters. And he didn't say from you. He said, you bring it from those who are your wives, sons, and daughters to you and the family. They're your most precious prized possession, right? That's the ones you love the most. You go take everything that they hold dear and bring it to me. Let's see if, you would, see if you're willing to do that. Let's see if you're willing to put your family second to this God that you want to serve. And they did. because It says, and they brought it, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it into a molten calf, a golden calf. And they, and they said, this will be our God, O Israel. This is, these be our gods, but which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw it, and he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to who? The Lord. Not to this calf, not to the Egyptian God, but to the Lord. Our Bibles don't really... The English version doesn't do that very, doesn't do God justice, but that's the one we looked at on Sunday of Yahweh, Jehovah. This is the one who is the beginning and the end. This is the one who started Genesis 1, John 1, ends Revelation 22. But tomorrow will be a feast unto Jehovah, and we'll use this calf to be the mediator since we have no idea where Moses is at. So Moses is up there literally communing with God, getting the law, getting everything together to bring them back home, to bring them in through this new place. They've left Egypt. They're in a new place to walk this road. And all of a sudden, everything else, they're going back to their old ways. How many of you have been tempted after this fast to go back and do some of the things that you fasted? Like, I don't, I don't know if it was cake or coffee or whatever. I know, I'm not a huge coffee drinker, but I had a great cup of coffee today. And I used Anthony's creamers that we got him for Christmas because they're in the kitchen. I saw those today, and I was like, ooh, he told me these were really good. We got Grace and some food, and I was like, I'm going to get a big cup of coffee to get me through tonight. And I did, and I was like, and I'm going to use his creamers. But I already told him. But I'm his boss, so what's he going to do? Tell me No. I can't give them back. And it was really good. I didn't fast coffee necessarily, but if I loved coffee the way that some of you probably do, I'd be tempted to go back to it. 
after the fast. You know, I've been tempted to eat desserts. You know, I, I kind of gave all that stuff up. And, man, I've been real tempted. I ate a little bit of some on my birthday and different stuff. But I can take a chocolate cake to the closet real easy. And a gallon of ice cream in the other hand. And here we go. We're going to go find Jesus on the mountaintop right now. So they're kind of starting to already go back to some of their Egyptian ways just because we don't know where God went. We don't know where this dude went that, that left us out of here, that took us out of Egypt. So jump to verse 13 through 19. And let's, let me show you Moses' reaction. All this is happening. The Lord tells Moses, get down there. Tell them, get ready, because I'm killing them all. I'm going to wipe them out. They're idiots. They're, they're, already, they're going back. They're rebelling. They've already made a covenant with me. And in this covenant is what I've declared for them to do. Remember when they went across the Jordan? They made the covenant with me. They're committing adultery on me with these other gods. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to get them out of the way. So Moses right here is pleading in verse 13. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, which is who? Jacob, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self. You swore by your own name. Remember, we just sang about that at the end. He, is, he has the most beautiful name, the name that is above every name. You swore by your own name and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I will give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. The Lord is literally hung by his own words. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Let me ask you a deep theological question. Does God, can God change his mind? Yeah, absolutely. Do you change your mind on things? Yeah. I just blew some of your minds right there. But God knows everything. Of course he does. And he can change his mind if he wants to. He's God. There's several instances in the Bible where he's having counsel in heaven talking to whatever else is up there besides not us and talking about the events on earth and they're discussing what to do on earth. Literally at a round table. You know, it's kind of like King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table. They're discussing those things and God changes his mind about what to do. I'm like, now that's cool. I mean, I know he's God and he can do whatever he wants. He wanted to wipe everybody out for being stupid. I kind of have those feelings a lot of times. I'm like, let's just wipe them out, God, because they're all stupid. But Moses says, no, no, remember what you said about to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, about the seed and the multiplying. We've looked at all that already. He said, you can't do that. And so the Lord said, you know what? You're right. Oh, let me give you a great example. Have you ever had something happen in your life and you just want to quit it or you want to throw it against the wall and the Lord says, no, just wait? Have I ever had that? We have to be patient. Doesn't that stink? It's like, God, don't change my mind right now. I'm ready to throw this up against the wall. And he's like, no, just wait. I don't care who they are. Just wait. They're mine. Let me handle it. Oh, I hate that. But that's exactly what he was having to do right here. I think that's why we don't like it so much either, because the Lord's like, you know what? Sometimes I just want to do this. And, and, but when God promises something, he has to fulfill it. It's his word. He's literally hung by his own word. That's why people study the Bible. You'll find out God's a really good God. And he's only a good God because he says that he is. Verse 15 says, And Moses turned and he went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both of their sides, and on one side and the other they were written. And the tables were of the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven or pushed, literally it means pushed by the finger of God into these tables or into these tablets. This is the original iPad right here. God had it first. This is all by the hand of God. And I love this. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's noise of war in the camp. We're under attack. Something's going on. In verse 18, and he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. He said, it's not the sound of Israel winning a war. It's not the sound of them being defeated. He said, but it's the noise of them that, I, that sing is what I hear. He knew immediately when he came come down the mountain of what exactly was going on. He was like, have you ever been uh, 
been going somewhere, maybe going through Amarillo in the evenings, or uh, I don't even know where parties even are. I have no idea. But uh, if you go on vacation, you come across, and you can hear the noise, the, the music, and people are ah, they're cackling and being all stupid and drunk. Everybody know what that sounds like? Remember your BC days. You probably were one of those, okay? Okay, so during that time, you can tell when there's something going on that isn't good, right? You can hear that. You can hear that party and, and that, that whatever, that atmosphere. You can feel that tension. You're like, oh, man, that's not cool. Moses comes down the mountain. He hears what's going on down there and goes, I know what that is, and this stinks. He already knows what's going on. He's like, Lord, I understand now why you wanted to do what you wanted to do. But you can't. He's, and so Joshua, of course, is the rookie, thinking, oh, we're under attack, because he was a warrior. He was a fighter. He's like, he's ready to go to town. And he says, it's not that. He said, they're down there, and they're singing, and they're dancing, and they're partying, and it's not what it's supposed to happen. It wasn't war in the camp. It was rebellion in the camp. It was adultery in the camp. It was God having to deal with a broken heart in the camp. Hence the reason why Jesus came. But we'll get into that later on. And I encourage you with this in closing. Don't let the false places in your life replace the fruit of the land. Because as we move into these new things, the enemy is going to unfortunately be right there to try to tempt us out of this new place God has for us. And what can look, can, what can look to be true, if the enemy has a hand in it, will be false. It's called deception. Deception looks good and right, right? But it's not. It's, it's intentionally made to look good to deceive us. In that deception, you just ate it, hook, line, and sinker. Don't let the false replace your fruit. Because now we're in a path of getting fruit. Now we're in a place of a brand new place. And even if you didn't fast in any part of this church, when God draws us closer to him, you bear new fruit. That's why it says, Behold, all the old things have passed away, and everything has been made new to be renewed by your mind by the continual washing of the Word of God. We're continually staying in a place of new. That's why you go from glory to glory. But in those places, the enemy is always right there to try to bring you back and to take you back into stuff that you don't need to be in. This is a new place and a new chapter for our lives, wherever we are and whatever that means for you. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go to heaven right now. You might, but wherever God has you, this is a new place for you. So walk in that new place. Flip your Bibles to Hebrew 12, Hebrews 12 real quick. Just to give you some encouragement from Paul about running the race and all that stuff. You probably already know what this scripture is. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing that we're also surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets or entangles our feet. And let us run with what? Dang, here's that word again. With patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's beginning and end. He's already taken care of it all. Now you just run the race. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the end place of where the children of Israel are. And if you go back and look at the beginnings of Joshua, you'll see that, that as they crossed the Jordan, all of this that we're talking about was being presented to them right there. You're coming into a new land. You're getting ready to reap the fruit of this land. But remember everything that God has brought us through. Remember the fasting. Remember the trials. Remember the toil. Remember all that stuff. Because when you get over here, it's going to be real easy to give up and serve other gods. Not to give up and quit serving God but to give up and to serve other gods and mix it in with each other. That's why the mixed kingdoms in the book of Daniel were so treacherous. is because they had God, but they mixed it with other things and it became pagan. See, the unholy and the holy doesn't mix. You can't have a little bit of the devil in heaven. He's been expelled. He's over. It's done. You know, you can't go in there looking at pornography the day before Jesus comes. And he can go, oh, you're still good. There's only one day. You can't go in there, you know, you can't go to heaven with the 40 in your hand. It doesn't work that way. You can't bury all your gold and money. Is that right? Is that a 40? Is that, is that, is that a right? Anthony, you know these things. Okay. <laughs> I know your BC life. Okay. So you can't, you can't go to heaven doing that stuff. You know, 
you either got to be all in for God or not at all. That's why I said in Revelation, you're either hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, there's no place for you. We're, we're in a place in the world now where it's either you're hot or you're cold. You know, I, I can't remember the Katy Perry song, but I think there's one about being hot and cold. Something about that, and you're in and you're out, and you're left and you're right, and you're up and you're down, and whatever that stuff is. She'll come back to God one day. She's got too much of God in her with her, with her goofy parents that she'll come back. But, you know, the, you, you're either, you got to be with God or you're not. There is no more middle ground. And people are finding that the church is finding that real quick. Um, how many of you watched the President's Day of the Union address? Okay. A few of you. How many of you missed it? We were at ball games. We missed it. No oh, good grief. Okay. It's all right. I missed it too. I caught the highlights on YouTube, but. Uh, in the State of the Union address, when he spoke of, you know, they always speak, oh, the land's strong, it's better than it's ever been. Fruit will always show what's really going on. So when God has called for the fruit of the land in your life, let that fruit produce at the right time. Don't try to go out there and make the fig tree happen early. We saw what happened with Jesus in that. Just simply be patient and let it work out as you cross the Jordan in each of those places. Amen? Because as you do that, then it fixes it. As you do that, our lives change piece by piece, day by day. Paul said, at the end of this thing, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I can look back and go, man, <laughs> we really did it. We're going to look back years from now on this church and go, man, guys, we did it. You remember when this church was at 7th and Quinn for however many years, and now we're at 7th and Quinn? <laughs> we did it. We stay faithful to the very end. Now, I don't know what's going to happen, but if we move and, got, and have a 5,000-member church, or if we stay right here and have a 500-member church, I am just as happy with all that. Because I know this place, and this is great. You know, Whatever God's called you in, just stay faithful in it. That's all I can say, because the fast is done. This is, a lot, it's all, this is the last evening I'm talking about it. We're moving on next Wednesday. It's going to be a brand new series, brand new stuff. But in the midst of all that, I'm not, I think it's Wednesday. I probably have to talk about repentance from Sunday night in here for people whose team lost. <laughs> That's why it's going to be brand new. But wherever God is calling you in this place, you know, just stay faithful in it. I'm telling you, this year is going to be good. Some of you, you're going to move into some good things. You've walked so faithfully through 16 and 17, and this is your year of breakthrough. This is your year of beginnings. Some of you are going to find God in so many cool ways. It's going to be amazing. I'm trying not to look at you but I am. You're going to find God, brother. It's going to be so good. And I love it because that's exactly what we're called to be. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. We just love God and love people. Amen? Amen. Stand up with me. Father, we thank you.